Good afternoon, and welcome to a special podcasting event. Today, we are proud to present a very special program where we'll be discussing a number of issues, both timely and timeless, with a pillar of the Jasper and Evansville communities of Indiana. I am referring, of course, to Father Raymond Brenner, or simply Father Ray, as he is widely known. Uh, Father Ray is revered locally and in religious circles alike as a champion of the human spirit. Uh, His undying devotion to God's message has led to an enriching life of faith and love. Father Ray is a man of the people and has been featured, incidentally, many times in the online media and physical press as the subject of a number of news stories as recently as the end of last year. Uh, His efforts have yielded great strides for a number of his favorite charities and his community in general. Uh, His name has appeared, as I mentioned a moment ago, on countless news websites, uh, including some of the uh, the major news networks network affiliates throughout the country. Uh, That's to say ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC, and, uh, and many more. But it goes without saying that I am honored to be interviewing this man today. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Father Raymond Brenner of Evansville, Indiana. Welcome to the show today, Father Ray. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. I should say, welcome to your show, (laughs) as as it is your program. Uh, Well, nevertheless, it is wonderful to be a part of the experience. Um, It's it's worth noting to our listeners as well, Father Ray, that um, uh, he, uh, he, Father Ray just recently retired. I want to point that out. And this is after a very lengthy and esteemed position at St. Joseph Catholic Church of Jasper, Indiana. Um, About two months now, not even. Uh, It's just shy of two months since he retired. About a month and a half, I would say. And um, we're going to get into that and more as we progress through the program. But first... We're going to go back to the back to the beginning, the very beginning, and uh, and start there. Did you know, Father Ray, when you were young, uh, when you were a child, that uh, that yours was to be a life of faith and devotion to the Lord? Uh, in other words, did you receive a clear calling? Uh, explain to us a little how this journey of faith began for you. Well, um, first of all, my parents were very strong believers in God and in the church. Um, I was born with a a diuretic stomach, so I lived the first 18 months of my life on butter, milk, and bananas. Um, Really should not have survived, but uh, due to a doctor, a country doctor, who kind of knew his business uh, as far as what to give me, uh, that was my diet for first eight years of my life. Mm. So I had a lot of people praying for me, yes. um, relatives, neighbors, um, groups of sisters and priests, um, and, and all of that. Then at uh, six, well, I started four days in the first grade and then came down with polio. Mm. And uh, so, you know, again, a lot of prayers. Uh, we were quarantined, uh, had a quarantine time on the post of the porch so that uh, nobody was allowed to come in and visit, although my uh, brother, two brothers and my sister were allowed to go to school, but they were not allowed to come into my room uh, because at that time, that was 1949, there was very little known about polio, whether it was contagious or not. And so, uh, you know, but the prayers continued. And uh, the fact that I survived the polio, uh, again, a lot of people kind of put that idea in my head that I was being spared for something special for God. Of course. And so, you know, that prompted a lot of thinking in that way, Um, but it still meant a long way to go in order to accomplish that. Okay. And... Throughout this period, did you begin to feel a natural inclination towards generosity and charity, or did that come when you were a little bit older? 
Well, my parents were very uh, generous. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we lived on a farm. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. And um, in fact, uh, my, my, when I was born, my father was working in Evansville, but uh, his father-in-law asked him to quit his job there and to take over the farm, which was 160 acres at that time. And um, so, you know, they were constantly uh, giving things, produce from the garden away. Um, the Little Sisters of the Poor were in Evansville at that time, and they uh, had chickens, they raised chickens in town, and uh, so they would come around with a, a pickup truck, and they, he would come back to the corn crib and be in however much corn they thought they might need. Uh, for some days, and also, um, I don't remember what it stood for, but it was called Crop Project. Uh, they would do come around with a wagon or, or truck and, uh, you know, just load out some corn from the from the corn bin. And uh, so, so my parents were just, you know, constantly giving away uh, produce. My dad had an egg route for a number of years. And um, as we, even as we moved away, we uh, kids moved away. Um, they raised as much garden. It's just that they had a lot more to give away uh, to, like the egg customers, because a lot of them were uh, uh, widows and widowers. So they were always very generous. Right. I mean, they gave to the church and supported other activities as well. Well, charity and generosity, giving in general, it uh, it really does play a, a, a very central role in your life and has for a very long time, clearly. Um, if you wouldn't mind, please tell me about some of the groups that you currently support or that you've supported in recent years, some of your favorite charities. Well, you know, it, it's like sometimes uh, I think people in general need uh, some incentive for giving, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it involves, uh, you know, a particular instance in their own life, uh, a family member or whatever. And when I was my previous assignment was at Resurrection before I went to St. Joe Jasper, and we had uh, Brock Hurdle, who went to St. Jude's, and uh, you know they they worked with him, and for a while they had. A, his cancer in arrest, but then it eventually came back. Um, the Benedictines and Franciscans were um, particular, you know, uh, I was kind to them too because mom had, uh, well, my dad's oldest sister was a daughter of charity. So, you know, we spent a lot of time with her, uh, but also mom had some cousins who were Benedictine and Franciscan sisters. So we would go to Oldenburg at least once a year to visit them. Right. Um, children from the area go to Riley Hospital in Indianapolis. Uh, so that's a particular uh, charity. St. Minard, I spent 12 years there because when I went there, they had a high school, college, four years of high school, four years of college, four years of theology. So I'm what they call a lifer there because yes. I spent that much time in schooling there. Right. Um, I worked with the Sisters of Providence in my first assignment, mm -hmm. which was in St. John's Ligoti. And so uh, they were teaching in the school there. And then my, uh, uh, all my brothers and my sister uh, spent some time at Modern Day High School. Right. So that's, and that's one of the, Catholic high schools in our territory. So those are my connections with the, those um, basic charities, you know, that I support. Right. Well, you've certainly never shied away from uh, promoting yourself as a vehicle to advance these organizations, putting yourself at the center of things be it an event, uh, uh, yeah, fundraisers, things like that, uh, press releases, news articles, uh, things of that nature to uh, encourage people to, to donate to these causes. Um, but you mentioned a moment ago that sometimes people do require 
a little uh, a little bit of a push. Um, what, what, what would you say is the most effective way to inspire charitable activity in people who are otherwise not inclined well, that way? Yeah, well, somehow you need to kind of get out, get the message out there as far as the good that they do in the community. And, um, you know, some of these organizations have a visible presence in the sense of the people that they have helped. Right. Um, you know, plus the, the fact that they raise funds for, you know, a ban or something like that. They transport people to and from the particular places. Mm-hmm. But, um, like I said, you know, of course, the, uh, you know, some of the religious orders are um, having problem recruiting members now because of the fact that, you know, there, there aren't as many of them and they're not in the schools like they used to be to sort of inspire. Uh, people, right? Um, it, it, uh, you know, some kind of presence I think that inspires people to give. Okay, very good. And uh, your standing in the community is uh, is very important, not only to the church but to Jasper as a whole. Um, now, the answer to this question. I expect hasn't changed all that much in the last month and a half since you've retired. So, um, but, but I, you know, I'll go ahead and ask it. What are some local events, organizations, fundraisers, and the like um, in which you're involved or have been involved in the last few years of your career? Well, I'm, I'm still on the, uh, uh, Jasper has a hospital, Memorial Hospital. Uh, run by a, a little company of married sisters. I'm still on that board till at least December, unless I submit a resignation before then. Mm-hmm. Um, also on a nursing home board. Um, I'm on a member of the Order of the Moose, right. uh, and they have a charitable organization, a place they call Moose Heart, which uh, takes in kids and helps them out. Um, so I'm, you know, still connected with uh, some of those, uh, plus the fact that I still have a number of uh, weddings scheduled for there in Jasper. Right, right. Okay, so your your involvement continues, but in a diminished, you know, kind of diminished way. Yeah, we, we just completed a, a project there at St. Joe Jasper. The church was built and finished in 1880. Right. And the windows were put in 120 years ago, wow. and um, the um, you know the, the lead and it, it is supposed to last 100 years. Well, you know these were 20 years beyond that, so some of them were beginning to sag. And we had a capital campaign uh, between the diocese and uh, the local church to raise funds. Mm-hmm. And so that was our big push in order to raise the funds for the you know, right. to try to meet our quota. So the windows that were put in for uh, uh, $9,000, it cost nearly a million dollars to restore them. Wow. But we took them back to their original. Uh, in other words, in some of the borders, for instance, uh, were uh, almost completely faded out. Right. So they had to develop the glass, um, stencil it, refire it, and all these went back to went to uh, Wisconsin um, near Madison to be completely taken apart and re-leaded. And if there uh, was a piece of glass that had been replaced at one time, didn't match the rest, uh, they came up with uh, a process to refire and uh, restore those. So so they right now look like they're the original did. Wow. And for those uh, for those of you listeners out there who, who don't really know much about St. Joseph Parish, um, it was founded, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Father Ray, but it was founded in 1837 by a Croatian missionary priest uh, by the name of Father Joseph Kundek. Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, Kundek. Um, 
Quebec actually didn't go there till uh, about 1840. Um, okay. You know, they, they had a small group of Catholics there that worshiped together. And the bishop, in passing through one time, came across these uh, Catholics who couldn't speak English. And so he went back to Europe and pleaded for uh, a priest who could come and minister to the German Catholics. Right. And so Father Father Kundek, Father Joseph Kundek, came from Croatia. Okay. And he was there a long time, and he, he is buried in the cemetery there at St. Joe's. It's an iconic church, to say the least, with an incredibly rich history. Uh, I know that there was uh, a story that you had shared with me at one time, and also it's on your, your website, RaymondBrenner.com. Uh, it was the story about that violent storm that threatened the lives of the German immigrants a uh, hundred years ago or so. Well, it's on the, on the, it's on the uh, south lawn of the church. And, um, you know, they had a lot of stone cutters. In fact, the, the parishioners actually built the church. Right. Uh, each one had an assigned day, or they could uh, pay someone to take their place. But uh, anyway, there were some, uh, a group of folks from Hoffenweiler in Germany that were on their way there, mm -hmm. and they thought they were going to shipwreck. And one of them vowed that if they survived, he would erect a cross right. on the, on the property there, and uh, it was uh, a lot of it was destroyed by uh, I think it was a hurricane that went through Jasper years ago, but uh, they uh, rebuilt it. So that was in the twenties, if I'm not mistaken, late 1920s, I, early 30s, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Long time ago, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> Before my time. <laughs> right, right. So then the replacement. So there's there's been a replacement cross since then. Yes, and and that's still part of the the tour when they, uh, you know, when they take people on a tour of the church, right, in the grounds there. That's uh, one of the things they point out because there's been a, a marker uh, put there explaining about the, you know, the. Uh, who all was responsible sure. for seeing that this cross was put there? Of course. And then on the on the east lawn, there's the the, the plaza of pastors. Is that still there? Yeah, it is still there. Oh yeah, that that's not going anywhere. No, I can't are, imagine. Uh, I can't imagine it is. 